this is a slide that I left out because I, I put it in my my review slide uh, portion of my uh, whatever it is. This is rheumatic fever. Okay, you can see it pretty much looks very very similar to morantic vegetation uh, because of the fact that it what goes along the lines of closure of the valve. So you would abs actually absolutely need history to be able to say, well, this is rheumatic fever versus morantic vegetation from some colon cancer or something like that. So it looks exactly the same. There's no difference at all. This is fibrinoid necrosis, as is the necrosis of uh, all immunologic diseases. Okay? So let's uh, continue on with our respiratory. We left off with this slide. This is an alveolar macrophage that's phagocytosed uh, yeasts. This is the nucleus, guys. That's not the yeast. Those are the yeasts. Okay? And as I said, it's the only uh, systemic fungus. I kind of sizzles today. My mouth is dry. It's the only uh, systemic fungus that has um, um, yeast forms phagocytosed by macrophages. So this is very unique to histoplasmosis. Remember, we think about spelunkering. What's spelunkering? Cave exploration, because what's in caves? Bats. Ooh. Okay, and then we have those little blackbirds out there. What do they call them? Starlings. What's pigeons? Cryptococcus. Cryptococcus. Very good. You <laughs> guys, that's amazing. You haven't forgotten. <laughs> this is very good. That's all I have to say on histoplasmosis. Okay, this is broad-based bud. Broad-based bud. Broad-based bud. That's a broad-based bud. Blasto. It's all bees. Blasto has broad-based bud. <laughs> Last one, broad weight butt. Got it? This exact picture is on boards. Okay, so it's got a broad base to the butt as opposed to cryptococcus where it's very, very constricted. It'd be just kind of like, like a little point there. Whereas blasto is broad based. Okay. Why they think that's important, I don't know. I've never seen a case of it, but they, they think it's important, so you've got to play the game. Uh, Aspergillus has got three different diseases that you must know. One is it loves to inhabit abandoned TB cavities, and they call that a fungus ball, or an aspergilloma, a very common cause of massive hemoptysis. So you can have this right up or left upper lobe cavitary lesion, and aspergillus just loves to live in it. It's called the fungus ball. Okay, that's one manifestation. Two, it's a vessel invader. So it can invade the vessels in the lung, and then produce thrombosis and infarction of those vessels. So they're vessel invaders, too. Three, you can have allergies to the moles. Um, so it can produce extrinsic asthma, type 1 hypersensitivity. So it has three different manifestations from fungus ball, invasive uh, vascular disease producing uh, hemorrhagic infarctions in the lung, uh, to plain old asthma. Okay, this is the way they look, guys. You should know this. Uh, hopefully, you microbiology people, I never really asked, do they? They show pictures of infectious disease. They show you this? Huh? Should have. If they didn't, get some boards. This is called a corona. Okay, it kind of looks like a crown. There it is. Either that or you put your finger in a 220 socket and that's your hair going up. Okay, that could be too. <laughs> that's the one I like, kind of. Notice it's septate. Okay, so it's very, very characteristic. Mucormycosis is non-septate and has wide angles. Aspergillus has narrow angles in its body and has these coronas, coronas, aspergillus. Pneumocystis used to be under the protozoal classification, is now considered a fungus. Did they tell you that? But they still have it under protozoa. Because that actually just changed over the last maybe two years. In fact, one of the guys in my uh, school is uh, a parasitologist, one of the ones that found that out. So it's actually a fungus, because it has more things in its cell wall that look like a fungus than a protozoa. Uh, better look at this, because this is a very common picture on boards. Of course, you mainly associate this with uh, HIV, and it is the first uh, AIDS-defining lesion. And it's the most common AIDS-defining lesion. As soon as that helper T cell counts 200, it seems to be there. It used to be the most common cause of death, in AIDS, but it no longer is, is because as soon as you hit uh, in a CD4 uh, count of 200, you automatically prophylactically put you on trimethyl sulfamethoxazole, and so you don't get it. Anybody know the other uh, disease that you prevent by, by preventing um, pneumocystis? What other disease do you prevent? 
toxoplasmosis. So you kind of get two for one with that. Okay. Remember, toxoplasmosis is the most common cause of a space-occupying lesion in the brain in a patient with AIDS. Always asked. So what it looks like, this is a silver stain. And we use silver stain for a number of things already, haven't we? Bartonella henslei, that's laryngeomatosis, remember? Legionella, you can't really see Legionella with gram stains, so they use the silver stains called Dietoli silver stain. Uh, and we have here pneumocystis carini. These are the cysts of pneumocystis carini. You can only see them with silver stain. They kind of look like ping pong balls, okay? This one's been crushed, but they kind of have that ping pong ball look. And these are the cysts of pneumocystis carini. This is the way it looks in the alveoli. You can see it produces this uh, kind of foamy, bubbly uh, alveolar infiltrate. These patients have incredible dyspnea, tachypnea. When you do a chest x-ray, it's all white out because of all this, uh, this uh, uh, involvement of the alveoli. Pneumocystis carini. By the way, it's not just in the lungs. You can see pneumocystis carini in any organ you want. Its notoriety is in the lung, but you can see it in lymph nodes and HIV-positive people and other areas. So it's not just lungs. Pleiades. This is the upper lobe of the lung. Pleiades. TB. Okay. So you've got a cavitary lesion, primary or reactivation. Reactivation. Primary TB is the lower part of the upper lobe or the upper part of the lower lobe. So it's kind of in the middle section and right out near the pleura. That's primary TB. They have a gone focus and a gone complex. Okay, most people recover from that and then if you get uh, immunocompromised or whatever, you get reactivation of that, then it usually goes into the apex and produces a cavitary lesion. There is no gone focus, there is no gone complex in reactivation TB. That's only primary TB. Boy, do we, we, have, boy, do we have people the ADDers are just having a blast. You should have seen how many eyes were on you. It was about maybe a hundred. <laughs> That's two per person. Okay. So that means fifty times two, about fifty ADDers in here. That was, okay. Okay. Now, lest you uh, be confused on this thing, there are other things that can cavitate in the upper lobes. Which systemic fungus is kind of like the TB? of the lung, histoplasmosis. So this could have been histo, okay? Which cancer can cavitate in the lungs? Squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. What bacteria that has a big mucus wall around it can also produce cavitation in the upper lobe? Klebsiella pneumoniae. So many, many things can cavitate. So you can't say unequivocally that's TB. You would have to do, uh, you know, stains, you know, your acid fast. And by the way, what is an acid fast stain staining? Mycolic acid, that's another board question. Okay, so all that cavitates in the upper lobe is not necessarily TB. This happens to be TB, though. Oh, boy, they're really getting into the uh, foreign body stuff and where it goes in the lung. What I'm going to tell you here is correct. If you heard anything else from anybody else, it's wrong, because I have studied this thing big time with an anatomist, okay? And there's a lot of discrepancies in the literature on what goes where, in what different positions. What I'm telling you here is absolutely correct, no doubt about it. Okay, I went to an expert anatomist on bronchopulmonary segments, and we moved that sucker all the way around, and, uh, uh, you know, the little models, this is correct. The Germans were right. Okay, I went to German anatomy books, and they were the only ones that were correct on this. If you are standing or sitting up, okay, it's going to go right here. That's the postural basal segment of the right lower lobe. So it's the most posterior segment of the right lower lobe. That's where it goes, just like, just like that. If you are lying down, which is the most common one where you can aspirate things, you go right here. You go to the, uh, the little segment right above the posterior base. That's called the superior segment of the right lower lobe. Just like walking in a manhole, boom, right down there. If you're lying on your right side, you can go either of two places. You can go to your middle lobe, which is J, and this is the only one that's up below. <clears throat> or it can go to the posterior segment of the right upper lobe. Okay, that's if you're lying down on your right. If you're lying down on your left and you aspirate, it'll go to the lingula. Okay? So, sitting, standing, where does it go? Postural basal segment. Oh, yeah, give me the, the letters. K, okay? That's the postural basal segment, uh, right lower lobe. You're lying on your back, where will it go? I, what is that called? Superior segment. You're lying on your right side. Two answers. 
J H. Very good. Got it. Now you ask it. So that gets into the concept of abscesses in the lung. The most common cause of an abscess is aspiration of oral pharyngeal material. So we see this commonly in street people that don't have good dentition, and they might be drunk, and they you know fall down like that, and a lot of oral pharyngeal material can get aspirated. Okay, and that's who you usually see this in. So having said that, we know that oral pharyngeal material has aerobes and anaerobes, and so it's very putrid. It's incredibly uh, stenchy because you have mixed aerobe, anaerobes. You've got fusel bacterium in there, all kinds of horrible uh, gram, uh, uh, anaerobes. You've got uh, Bacteroides melanogenicus, all kinds of horrible things uh, in there. So it's a mixture. If I told you this is uh, uh, the... Uh, the uh, right lung, and this was the uh, upper lobe, and this was the lower lobe. I want you to tell me what caused this abscess. They were lying down on their right side because this is the upper lobe, and there's a lesion in the posterior segment, guys. There you go. Okay. Now, you can get abscesses in a lung also, of course, from just plain pneumonia. And Staph aureus is famous for that. Klebsiella is famous for that. But not near as common as aspiration. Okay, so that's one you want to remember, aspiration. You do chest x-rays, you see fluid cavities uh, in, the, uh, in the lung. We've already discussed pulmonary embolus uh, to a certain point. There's two kinds of emboli that you can throw. You can throw little tiny ones, okay, that produce those wedge-shaped hemorrhagic infarctions, or it can produce, chip, uh, chip off large ones. This is a large one. This was on board, this picture. Okay, what's this? It's a bronchus, guys. It's been opened because you can see the linear lines there. You can see the cartilage. Okay? That's a vessel. What's in there? An embolus. Okay. Now, here's something where all of the pathology literature is wrong on right now, including Robbins, because they don't read the medical literature. And that is where most pulmonary emboli originate from. Now, all the pathology books say it's a deep venous, uh, uh, the deep veins of the lower leg. That's the most common site for thrombosis. That's correct, but it is not the most common site for embolization. Okay? You can read any surgery book. You read Washington Manual. You read Surgery Washington Manual. You read any other book, Medicine, Cecil's, whatever. Okay? The answer is the femoral vein. It's the most common location for embolization. It actually makes sense because venous clots propagate towards the heart. When you start going and starting in the deep veins of the lower leg and it starts propagating up into the femoral vein, that's a larger caliber vessel, so it's more likely to chip off. So the femoral vein is the most common site for embolization to the lung. The deep veins of the lower leg is the most common site for, for where deep venous thrombosis begins. So it's when it gets into the femoral vein that it's dangerous for embolization. That's been, that's been true for the last three years, guys. I don't know where the pathology books are going. They must not be reading that kind of literature. So small ones produce a hemorrhagic infarct. That is if you have underlying lung disease. If I had a small little embolus, I probably wouldn't infarct because I have normal lungs. But if you have pre-existing disease in your lungs and you throw off a small embolus, you will infarct. In fact, 85% of the time, a little embolus, a little thrombus, a little embolus will not produce an infarction. 15% of the time it will, and it usually be in those that have pre-existing lung disease, like smokers, for example. The other type of embolus is called a saddle embolus. That's a huge, huge, huge. It's probably from way up here in the ileal femoral area. And it blocks off the orifices of the pulmonary vessels, pulmonary arteries. You knock off at least three out of the five orifices of the pulmonary vessels, you're dead in a millisecond. It's kind of like, oh, that's it. Okay. So there's no infarction because you don't have enough time to infarct. Uh, it basically produces acute right heart strain and immediate death. And this is an example of a saddle embolus, a huge, huge embolus that not only probably block this vessel off, but probably other ones as well. I mean, that is a boom, just like that, that'll kill you. Okay. The uh, um, screening test of choice initially is the ventilation perfusion scan, okay? I know that uh, many of you come from maybe some big shot places and they say spiral CT is the way to go. Not yet, it ain't. And by the way, it really hasn't proven out to be all that good anyway. 
The answer is ventilation perfusion scan. That's the screening test of choice. Okay? And so you'll have ventilation to the lung, but you won't have perfusion. It's just a radio, uh, radioactive uh, radionuclide type of scan. No problem at all. The confirmatory test is a pulmonary angiogram. Okay? So that's what you need to know about that. Let's deal with restrictive obstructive lung disease. We'll do a quick review of what, you, what Dr. Passel taught you in terms of pulmonary function. We've come across this term restrictive before, haven't we? We came across it in terms of restrictive cardiomyopathy. And basically what it means is something's restricting it from filling. So we can have restriction of filling of the heart, restrictive cardiomyopathy with blood, or restriction in filling up the lungs with air. We have two terms that Passel taught you. Compliance is a filling term, and elasticity is an expiration term. So compliance means inspiration term, filling up the lungs with air. Elasticity is an expiration term, the recoil of the lung. Hmm? All right. Now, in restrictive lung disease, I want you to picture a hot water bottle. You know, little big, thick rubber things that you put hot water in, okay? Okay. Make believe that's what restrictive lung disease is, okay? Big, thick, rubber type of thing. And, and so you try to blow that up. Would you blow that up easy like a balloon? Oh, no. Okay, so in other words, compliance is decreased in restrictive lung disease. It's hard to fill the lung up with air. So what's preventing it from filling up? Fibrosis, interstitial fibrosis most commonly, okay? But if you get that, that hot water bottle thing blown up with air and you let the air out, elasticity, what's the elasticity? Increase. So compliance is decreased. You can't fill it up. But once you do fill it up, it comes out quickly. Elasticity increase. Is that correct? So if I was with someone with sarcoid, and they, you asked me to take a deep breath, I'd do something like this. Let it out. Okay. Decrease. I couldn't get full, all of it in because I, I'm something restricting it from filling. Fibrosis. But I can get it out fast. So obviously, all volumes and capacities are equally decreased. So total lung capacity, residual volume, tidal volume, everything's decreased. Okay? And then when you do the FEV one second, force vital capacity ratio, you can do it on a spirometer. You ask the person to take a deep breath. So then here's Joe with sarcoid, breathe in, breathe, takes his deep breath. Okay, gets it in. Okay, let it out, Joe. So what's the forced expiratory volume one second? That's the amount that you got out in one second. Okay, it's decreased. Normal is four liters. Um, patients with sarcoid restricted usually have it around three. So it's decreased. But what's the forced, uh, the forced vital capacity? That's the total amount that you got out after a deep inspiration. Well, what do you think that turns out to be in restrictive lung disease? It uh, actually oftentimes is the same as the FEV one second because of the increased in elasticity. So a lot of times it, it's the same. It's three liters. You got it all out in one second. So when you do a ratio of FEV one second to force vital capacity, it's high. It's increased. It's higher. The normal force vital capacity is five liters. So normally it's four over five equals 80%. But in restrictive lung disease, it's higher than that because the elasticity is increased. The force vital capacity, how much you can get out totally, is the same as the FEV one second because you get it out so fast. Okay. So that's very, very simple pulmonary function stuff. Not hard at all. Okay. What are some of the examples of restrictive lung disease? Well, the first group are called pneumoconioses. Those are airborne, dust-borne diseases. New York is famous for them. Okay. You know, it's famous. Big cities, L.A., famous for dust-borne diseases. We call those pneumoconioses. The ones that you need to know are coal workers, silicosis, and asbestosis. Those three are the ones you need to know. Coal workers is coal worker, you know. It's someone like West Virginia, Pennsylvania. They get anthracotic pigment. It sets up a fibrous reaction in their lung. Voila, they end up with restrictive lung disease. They have an increased incidence of TB, but not cancer. End of discussion. Then we have silicosis. Okay, those are the people that usually are sandblasters. They get the graffiti off of things. Or work in foundries that deal with rock and quartz and breaking them down and the possibility of bringing in the dust, breathing in the dust from those things. Silicosis. Okay, there you get these big nodules in the lung which really are as hard as rocks, literally, because there's quartz in them. 
and it looks like metastatic disease in the lung. It has huge nodules in the lung as hard as rocks because it's quartz, silica dioxide, that's sand. It's in your lungs. Very, very fibrous. Again, an increased incidence of TB, but not cancer. Now, if you happen to have rheumatoid arthritis and also have one of these pneumoconiosis, co-worker silicosis, you have a potential for a syndrome, which is called Kaplan syndrome, not to be confused with K, Kaplan, C, Kaplan. And what it is is rheumatoid nodules, the same ones you saw on that extensive surface of the arm that I showed you, they're in the lung. See, rheumatoid arthritis commonly involves the lung with fibrosis all by itself. And it can have rheumatoid nodules in the lung, not just here. That combination, rheumatoid nodules in the lung, plus a pneumoconiosis, co-worker silicosis, even asbestosis, equals Kaplan syndrome. And they like that. They like that. Okay. Now I'm going to show you asbestos. So we get the asbestos discussion done. Got two for one in this slide. Okay. Now, guys will easily recognize asbestos fibers because they look like dumbbells. There they are right there. Admittedly, very, very, very small weight dumbbells, but they do look like dumbbells. There's your little thing that you hold with your hand. There's the dumbbells at the end. You know, it's a good analogy because it's a asbestos fiber coated by iron. So it's really a very, very good analogy, dumbbells. Another name for them is ferruginous body. Ferruginous, of course, meaning the iron. So they can be called asbestos bodies or they can be called ferruginous bodies, whatever you want. But that's iron, coating these things. Now listen real careful on this, guys, real careful. The most common pulmonary lesion associated with asbestos exposure is not cancer. It's a fibrous plaque of the pleura. Okay, it's benign, totally, just, well, or benign fibrous plaque. So you just get a little area of fibrosis on either the visceral or the parietal pleura. That's the most common overall pulmonary lesion associated with asbestos. Not a precursor for mesothelioma, just a little, little patch of fibrosis. That's all. Now, the most common cancer, and you better listen up, is primary lung cancer. The second most common is mesothelioma. That's a malignancy of the cirrhosal lining of the lungs. Okay, with me so far? Okay. If you are a smoker and have asbestos exposure, you have an incredibly increased, uh, 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 increased chance of getting primary lung cancer. Here's an example of synergism again. Remember, smoking alcohol, those squamous cancers. Here's another one, asbestos and smoker. I mean, we're talking about you are clearly going to get primary lung cancer. There is no relationship of smoking enhancing the or increasing the incidence of mesothelioma. There's no smoking relationship. Now, listen careful. Listen careful. Here's the board question. They said they had a roofer who's been a roofer for 25 years. I have someone that puts on roofing. Okay. Now, that other matter, they didn't say asbestos, but you have to know that 25 years ago, all the insulation material had asbestos in it. As you recall, in New York City, that was a big problem when those buildings came down. It was asbestos exposure. And many of those people breathed it in. Okay, so they, they're going to have some problems 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the pike because they have massive asbestos exposure. Okay, because there's insulation of old buildings. So it's a 25-year-old worker, uh, asbestos, and they said, what would he most likely get? Now, benign pleural plaque was not down there, so you had to deal with cancer. What was the answer? Primary lung cancer. Okay. I believe they said he was a non-smoker. Okay? Yeah. They said he was a non-smoker. So 25 years, uh, a roofer, uh, he was a non-smoker. What would he likely get? Answer, primary lung cancer. Let's say he's a smoker. Answer, primary lung cancer. So whether you're a smoker or a non-smoker, what's your answer? Primary lung cancer. Okay? So where's mesothelioma fit into this thing? Well, mesotheliomas take 25 to 30 years to develop, okay? Lung cancers usually only take maybe 10 years to develop. So what's really, the reason why lung cancer is far more common than mesothelioma is you should die before you get your mesothelioma. And so they really are, have a very, very low incidence, okay? So whether you're a smoker or a non-smoker, 
If you have asbestos, asbestos exposure, you're more likely to get uh, primary lung cancer, not mesothelioma. That's the point I want to point out to you. So how do you get this exposure? The two key things, one's roofer, more than 25 years, and anyone working in a naval shipyard. And that's what they usually say, you know, shipyard, whatever. That's because all the pipes of the ships are insulated with asbestos. Those are the two, two that you're going to get. Roofer, shipyard, asbestos. Okay, that's it. This mesothelioma looks like uh, the lung was encased with icing. Okay, this is a malignant, highly malignant. Steve McQueen, great actor, Bullet, and all those different uh, excellent movies. Um, he was a uh, race car driver way, way back before he was a, um, an actor. And the brake lining, brake lining used to in the old days uh, have um, asbestos in them. They no longer have it. So he was exposed to that from changing brake linings. And also the, the headgear that they wore had asbestos in it in those, in those days. So he had a massive exposure to that. He died of a mesothelioma, Steve McQueen. Okay, that's asbestos and the diseases it causes. Okay. The second most common cause of restrictive lung disease is sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis. This is a classic x-ray of sarcoid. What do you think these things right over here are over there? Lymph nodes. In fact, radiologists call them potato nodes. It's so big, the hyaluronic lymph nodes are so big, they call them potato nodes. Okay, uh, I don't know if you can see this. I, th I think you can. I think you can see a haziness down over here and a little bit of a haziness over here. Can you see that? That's interstitial fibrosis. Okay. Sarcoid is a granulomatous disease that has no relationship whatsoever to infection. No one really knows what causes it. They know that people that live around pine trees seem to have an increase, but whatever, no one knows the cause of it. And it produces granulomas. Of course, non-caseating because this is not in a, a, a systemic fungus or TB. The lungs are always involved. That's the primary target organ. So it'll be some, and also it's more common in blacks. And so they usually use a black person, 35 years of age, who has dyspnea, and I say, then maybe throw this chest x-ray up there on the boards, and then you can look at it and see these hyaline nodes and stuff like that. Then they will always throw in something in the face. That's the second most common area it hits. Now, what, what in the area of the face? Well, uveal tract of the eyes, uveitis, will have blurry vision. Inflammation of the uveal tract produces a blurry vision. That's very, very common in sarcoid. Or it could involve the salivary glands that get enlarged or the lacrimal glands. So something related to the head, head, neck, face area. Eyes, uveitis, salivary glands. Okay? So that's what they usually do. The lung thing and something up here, black person, dyspnea, sarcoid. Okay? Part two, if you're interested, deals with the skin lesions in sarcoid. They're nodular lesions, and they say, what would you, if you biopsied one of them, what would you see? Well, that's a no-brainer, non caseating granulomas. That was the way they ask it on part two. They don't usually fiddle with that on part one. Now, some other things about this. This is diagnosis of exclusion, guys. You have to rule out anything that causes granulomas. So TB, you know, histo, and all those things. And all that stuff is negative. They have the right clinical presentation, sarcoidosis. Because the treatment's going to be steroids, so you've got to really be sure of your, of your diagnosis. Angiotensin converting enzymes sky high in these patients because the granulomas are just loaded in it. Hypercalcemia occurs, and very interestingly, very unusual mechanism, the actual, the macrophages in the granulomas, those epithelioid cells, make one alpha hydroxylase. So you should be able to fill in the rest of that. If they're making one alpha hydroxylase, then what is the mechanism of their vitamin of their uh, I said almost said it hypercalcemia, hypervitaminosis D. You're you're second hydroxylating more uh, of the vitamin D, and and therefore you have excess amounts of vitamin D. As you know, vitamin D increases the reabsorption of calcium and phosphorus, so hypercalcemia. Okay, sarcoid, very important, guaranteed board question. And uh, it's the most common non-infectious cause of granular cause of granulomatous hepatitis, TB being the most common cause of infectious. So it's big time. And second most common, pneumoconiosis. I don't have a picture of this next thing. We're still restrictive, guys. Farmer's lung, silofillers disease, bisonosis. Those are called hypersensitivity pneumonidides. I like that. Pneumonidides. Nice name. If you're 
pulmonologist and might want to name a kid. Hey, pneumonidity over here. <laughs> of course, you want a, you're a pathologist, your kid should be called Frank Necrosis Golion. Might, you know, might give him some notoriety. If you're in dermatology, whitehead, blackhead, that'd be cool. Nephrologist, nephritic, nephrotic, you know, get over here. You've got all kinds of interesting things you can call your kids, depending on your specialty. Of course, it's kind of mean because you're labeling the poor little dudes. Okay, but whatever. Students confuse farmer's lung and silo fillers disease, and I can understand why. They're both seen in farmers. So, remember one and the other one's the other one. Did you hear what I said? Remember one, the other one's the other one. See, if you try to remember two, guess what you'll do? You switch them. So, which one do I remember? For me, I like silo fillers disease because I know you put things in silos, a closed space, fermentation occurs, fermentation's gas. The gas is nitrogen dioxide. So the board question was, a farmer went in and into a room in his barn and suddenly developed uh, uh, wheezing, okay, and dyspnea, okay? That's because he breathed the nitrogen dioxide because of the fermenting thing. That's what I remember. Silo fillers is the gas thing because silos, you also know that many times you hear in the news about a silo exploding. Why do you think they exploded? They exploded because of the gas from fermentation. So I remember that one. That means the other one, farmer's lung, is thermophilic actinomycetes. They're out there in their tractor. Dust is coming up, and there's thermophilic actinomycetes that's blown up in the air. It's a mold. They breathe it in, and they end up getting dyspnea and hypersensitivity pneumonitis with eventually ending up with a restrictive lung disease. So you remember one, and the other one's the other one. I remember on my exam, guys, 1965, Monday morning blues. And that's bisonosis. Those are people that work in textile factories that have cotton, hemp, and linen. Okay? And they get Monday morning blues because they're sick all week. They go home on the weekend, they feel better because they don't have exposure, and they start getting depressed on Sunday about going to work on Monday and being sick again. And so the disease was called Monday morning blues. Of course, we have that all in here too, but we don't work in textile industry. We just don't like going to work on Monday. Let's just throw a Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday as well. Okay. No, the best day actually is Friday, thinking about Saturday. Okay. Then it starts going downhill from that. So Saturday actually, it's tossed up between Friday and Saturday. I think Saturday for me. I just love Saturday. I can actually sleep all night. Friday night I can sleep all night. Because I don't wake up thinking about what I'm going to lecture on. I don't have to think. <laughs> Saturday's a day of non-thinking. <laughs> no thinking at all. Just go out with the grandchildren and just have a blast and building them up into being power people. Getting them ready for survival techniques. You should see this. So cute. And I go. <laughs> so cute. Can you imagine his little... I say, it is so cute. I say, what are you doing? Kung fu. <laughs> Kung Fu, you think you're going to hurt Poppy? Yes. Let me see. <laughs> what a kick. You know, then they think that's so funny. They laugh like mad. They think that's the funniest thing in the world. Of course, they know it's not true. <laughs> but they make believe. Okay. This is called bisonosis. When you have uh, the uh, worker in a textile uh, factory, that's, they always tell you that. And then they get, uh, they have problems with dysmia. That's uh, bisonosis, B-Y-S, whatever. You can spell bisonosis yourself. There's a thing called manurosis, too, and you can imagine what that is. It's a hypersensitivity reaction to people that work with manure. They got crap in their lungs, literally. That was a joke. Some of you believed it. Some of you believed it. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Okay. See, raise his hand. You're the only one in the whole room that raised your hand. It's because you're the only honest one. All right. Those are the hypersensitivity diseases, guys, and also restrictive. Remember, good pasture syndrome begins in the lungs with, uh, with uh, a restrictive type of lung disease with a coughing up of uh, hemoptysis, you know, coughing up blood, and then ends up very shortly with the renal disease. So it starts in the lung and ends in the, uh, in the kidneys. Obstructive lung disease. Let's deal with our, our compliance and elasticity concept. <clears throat> Remember, in obstructive lung disease, you have no problem in getting air in, you have problem in getting it out. 
Why do you have not have a problem in getting it in? The answer is because your elastic tissue supports the stroid. So it's very easy to fill up your lungs. But because your elastic tissue support is destroyed, it's very hard to get it out because it collapses on expiration. So you get air in, but you can't get air out. So in a patient with obstructive lung disease, they breathe in, no problem. But they have a problem getting it out. Very hard. Okay? So something's left over in the lung. If you can't get all the air out, then that must mean residual volume's increased. Is that correct? Isn't it true that whenever something's left over, don't you say that's the residual? Okay, so if you can't get all the air out of your lung on each breath, then, then you're obviously your residual volume increases, which means then that total lung capacity is going to increase, which means then that diaphragms are going to go down as the lungs, since they're overinflated, and the AP diameter is going to go out. So that increased AP diameter, depressed diaphragms. Agreed? Well, it's only a certain amount of, of uh, expansion that your chest can undergo. And so then eventually, as you continue to, to trap the air in your residual volume, then you start compressing down and, uh, each of the other volumes that are remaining. So your tidal volume starts decreasing. Your vital capacity decreases. Because as your residual volume is increasing, it's just compacting those other volumes, and they begin decreasing. So you have decreased tidal volume. That's what you're doing right now, that normal breathing in and out. Your vital capacity decreases. So tidal lung capacity, residual volume, Increase, all the other ones decrease. When you ask these students to take a deep breath, I blow it all out. <clears throat> On a spirometer, what's FEV one second? Very low. They can get very little out because they're having trouble getting out. Usually it's around one liter versus four. In other words, you get, you get, you have a much better FEV one second with restrictive lung disease because of the fact that you can get air in at least. So it may be one liter. What's the force vital capacity, the total amount that they can get out? Three liters, maybe, versus five. Now, when you do a ratio of FEV one second of force vital capacity now, you can see it's way, way down there, clearly distinguishing restrictive from obstructive lung disease. Those of you taking part two, the FEV one second uh, force vital capacity are the best things to evaluate in a patient before they go into surgery if they have some underlying lung disease because it really uh, uh, gives a, a really good idea about how they're going to do after surgery, whether they're going to be on, on a respirator, you know, for a long period of time. So those are very important tests that really give a good idea of how well you're doing lung-wise. So those are your uh, PFTs, we call them pulmonary function tests. There are four types of, uh, of obstructive lung disease, bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, bronchiectasis, and asthma. These are all considered obstructive lung diseases. The ones associated with smoking are bronchitis and emphysema, those two. The other ones, not necessarily. Chronic bronchitis is a clinical diagnosis. And if a patient has productive cough for three months out of a year, for two consecutive years, they have chronic bronchitis. So it's purely clinical. Where, however, is the disease? Actually, it's in the terminal bronchioles. So remember, you have main stem bronchus, you have segmental bronchi, terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveoli. The moment you hit terminal bronchial, that's small airway. And our friend Paso taught you that it's all turbulent air up to the terminal bronchioles, because from that point on, there's parallel branching that occurs of your airways. Now, parallel means kind of like you ever see the, you know, uh, tennis contest. You see the names on these, on these lines. That's kind of how like, your airways are. They're all in parallel to each other. And so you can see that turbulent air hits those small airways, and it hits this mass of cross cross-sectional air with this multiple parallel branching of those small airways, what might have been initially turbulent, all of a sudden, now it's laminar airflow. Actually, by the time you hit your respiratory unit, it's actually not moving the air. Okay. Small, most small airway diseases in the terminal bronchial, guys. Inflammation of the terminal bronchial. And that, of course, produces wheezing. And that's the, actually the area chronic bronchitis. It's the same area as for asthma and for bronchiolitis 
It's the same area. So chronic bronchitis hits the same area as asthma does, the terminal bronchial. Of course, more proximal to that, you're getting mucous gland hyperplasia, goblet cell hyperplasia, and there's lots of crap, you know, that's coming up, and that's the productive part of the cough. But the actual area of obstruction is the terminal bronchial. And you have goblet cell metaplasia there. You've got these mucus plugs in there. Can you just picture this, guys? You have one mucus plug and one terminal bronchial. You are affecting a major cross-sectional area of lung because of all the parallel branches that derive from that thing. They can't. They've got CO2 in them, okay? And they're trying to get air past that mucus plug, and they can't. They can't. So the ventilation perfusion mismatch is incredible. No wonder why they're called blue bloaters. The blue means they're cyanotic. They can't get rid of CO2 because they've got stupid mucus plugs in the terminal bronchioles. Bad place to have them. You can't get rid of CO2. Okay, that's that. Emphysema is not in the terminal bronchioles. Emphysema is in your respiratory unit. What did Passel say your respiratory unit was? And by the way, what does it mean? Respiratory unit is where you can actually exchange gas. You cannot exchange gas in the terminal bronchial. In fact, another name for it is non-respiratory bronchial. You cannot exchange gas there. But it does have notoriety that it is the primary place for small airway disease and the origin of expiratory wheezing. So it has that notoriety. But it's not where gas exchange occurs. That's your respiratory bronchial, respiratory uh, alveolar duct, and alveoli. Okay, I'll show you that in a second. What do you see? An X-ray. That's right. See anything abnormal about it? It's hard seeing the heart, isn't it? What about those diaphragms? Are they low enough for you? Probably at the level of the umbilicus. <laughs> okay, a little increased AP diameter here. What do you think? Okay, it's this classic obstructive lung disease, x-ray. Has it been on boards? Oh, yeah. It's classic. It's got great notoriety all, all its own. <laughs> okay. This exact picture has been on so many boards, uh, so many examinations. You clearly see that you have an obstructive pattern here. You're having problem in getting air out because that's why the diaphragms are down and your AP diameter is increased. Now, a little dude can have this, a little three-month-old can have this if they had bronchiolitis due to respiratory syncytial virus. Or a newborn, maybe, maybe one or two weeks old, with chlamydia trachomatis pneumonia could look like this. Okay. Because you're trapping air. Okay, so here's your, uh, here's a nice diagram for you. Here's the terminal bronchial, and this is the beginning of your respiratory unit. Respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct and alveoli. This is where gas exchange can occur. You only need to know two emphysemas. You need to know central lobular and panacenar. Those are the two that you need to know, central lobular and panacenar emphysema. Okay. Now, before we start going into these things, remember, chronic bronchitis affects what part of the airway? This. Emphysema affects what part of the airway? This. So it's more distal to where chronic bronchitis is. So that when you have emphysema with lots of the inflammation associated with it, you not only destroy that respiratory unit, but you also destroy the vasculature associated with it. So you have an even loss of ventilation and perfusion. So you're not going to have retention of CO2 in these patients. When you have uh, uh, a, a problem mucus plugs in the terminal bronchial, which is way more proximal, and you affect the great cross-sectional area of lung, there's going to be a problem there. But when you're out this far, and you're also destroying the vessels that go along with this, you don't have an increase in CO2. That's why they call pink puffers. In fact, many of them have respiratory alkalosis. But that, 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 that concept and that distinction is going, to, going out the window right now, because most people have combinations of the two. I just wanted to just make sure you understood the pathophys of this. Now, central lobular emphysema is the one most often associated with smoking, and it's in the upper lobes. So it's an upper lobe emphysema, and the primary portion of the respiratory unit that is destroyed is the respiratory bronchial, the very first thing the smoke hits. Okay, and what happens is neutrophils um, will damage this, and the reason for this is, is that all people that smoke, all people that smoke, have more neutrophils in their lungs. Smoke is chemotactic to neutrophils. 
And that's not some, that's like 5%, that's not 3, no, you know, 15%, it's 100%. All smokers have increased neutrophils in their lungs. That's not cool. But here's the worst part. Do you know what alpha-1 antitrypsin does? Do you know what its real purpose is? It's an anti-elastase. Its only purpose in life is to destroy elastases produced by neutrophils. That's its function. If you're a smoker, that is denatured. So you really have acquired alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency as well. You don't have adequate amounts of alpha-1 antitrypsin, and you have too many neutrophils in your lung. A bad combination. And so that's why neutrophils have absolutely no problem in destroying the elastic tissue support of the respiratory bronchial. So here's what happens, guys. You breathe air in, no problem. But you try to get it out, and all of a sudden the air goes into this, there's no elastic tissue support. It just expands like that, kind of catches it, and doesn't go anywhere. That's why you form those big little blebs up there, those big cystic, you know, those big uh, areas, those uh, cystic areas on the lung. It's just trapped air in there because there's no elastic tissue. So when it try to get by, boom, that's what you see it expanding like this. That's central lobular emphysema, upper lobes. Now, in pan in our emphysema, remember pan means the same thing at net with pan cytopenia. You know, all the cells decreased, red blood cells, platelets, neutrophils. pan means the entire respiratory unit's destroyed because it's associated with no alpha-1 antitrypsin at all. Alpha-1 antitrypsin at all. It's a genetic disease, autosomal recessive. The liver doesn't make it. That's the problem. It doesn't make it. And so at a very early age, you develop destruction of your entire respiratory unit in your lower lobes. So this is a lower lobe emphysema. And so you can see respiratory uh, bronchioles was knocked out, alveolar ducts are knocked out, and alveoli are knocked out. So when the patient breathes in, air goes in, and they can't get it out because this entire respiratory unit catches it. And that's in your lower lobes. Well, some of you are pretty intuitive, and you're getting the idea that because I said that smokers have, in a sense, an acquired alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, that they could probably get an element of pinacetin emphysema as well in the lower lobes. Is that correct? You're right. So smokers can get two emphysemas. They can get the central lobular emphysema in the upper lobes, which knocks off the respiratory bronchial, and in the lower lobes, they get a pan type of pattern to their disease. So it's upper and lower lobes, but two different types of emphysema. <clears throat> Guys, this is the pleura. What's this? It's a bronchi, guys. Should bronchi go all the way to your pleura? When you do a chest x-ray, do you see bronchi extending to the, to the pleura? It's bronchiectasis. When you see bronchi going out further than just a little bit beyond the hilum, and you start seeing bronchi continuing on, it's bronchiectasis. Mechanism, infection, destruction of the elastic tissue support, dilatation of the airways. Segmental bronchi, bronchi. What happens then? They fill up with pus. See all this kind of liquid kind of crap here? It's all pus. So classically on boards, they'll say someone has a, uh, a productive cough of cupfuls. Not just a little bit, not just tablespoon. Cupfuls of pus. Because they are trapped. It's pus. Now in this country, cystic fibrosis is the most common cause of this disease. In third world countries, it's TB is the most common. If you have any idea or know of anybody that has a child with cystic fibrosis, you know that the parent's job each day is a horror show because they have to put their little dudes into all different kinds of positions to drain out the pus in their bronchiectasis. And you can imagine a little four-year-old, you know, over the edge of the bed with this big pan down there seeing all this pus come out from their bronchi. And they have to do this a couple times a day. Very bad. Can't break.